Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 614 of the podcast and it is Saturday 26th of March 2022 as I record this. On today's show I talk to Monica Leonel about how to use Kickstarter for your book and she gives some great tips about how to use Kickstarter most effectively, what kind of reward tiers might work, mistakes to avoid and how to market your project. It's a brilliant interview and off the back of this I've started my own project plan for how to write a novel and I plan to do my own Kickstarter in April or May. There are so many opportunities to find readers and make multiple streams of income these days and completely bypass the big stores. I know many of us want to play a different game and this is another piece of the puzzle. Also, we recorded this interview literally a few days before Brandon Sanderson's epic Kickstarter, which is still running as I record this and at over 32 million US dollars. Monica gives some more down to earth numbers in this interview. So don't worry, Kickstarter is not just for megastars. And we do (laughs) the Kickstarter we refer to for Brandon Sanderson is the one he did before, which made 6.7 million, which we thought was pretty good at the time. (laughs) So but yes, uh, lots of of Kickstarters are, you know, just at a thousand dollars or a couple of thousand dollars. So don't worry, there are lots of tips for normal people like us. So that's coming up in the interview section. So in the publishing news, well, it's not really news, but there was an article in The Guardian about Booker Prize winning novelist and poet Ben Okri, who has spent five years rewriting his 2008 novel Starbook to give more emphasis to a key theme. Now, I love Ben Okri. He is one of my favourite poets. And uh, so I, I always read the news about him. And this was really interesting. It backs up my personal episode 606 on rewriting my first novel after more than a decade. Now, different reasons, but some people questioned and sent comments and emails about whether this is actually allowed, as if somehow this is wrong in some way, or, of course, whether it's worth the time. And, of course, I think it's worth it, and since I'm an independent author, I'm allowed to do whatever I want with my intellectual property. I'm actually currently editing Ark of Blood, the third in the series, and I've rewritten and republished both Stone of Fire and Crypt of Bone, which are out now. But back to Ben Okri, uh, it says a new version complete with new title and new cover is to be published this summer as the last gift of the master artists. So the original was called Starbook and this is called the last gift of of the master artists, which I I think I like this new title better. And Okri believes that he has given more emphasis to transatlantic slavery and will now offer his readers a more considered narrative. Okri said, There is perhaps nothing to gain for me from this but a good artistic night's sleep. I didn't tell anyone I was doing it. It is just a personal thing. I'm not aware of others doing this. Oh, yes, Ben, there are lots of people in the independent author community. (laughs) But it, this is interesting, of course, that this is traditional publishing. The Guardian is very traditional publishing. Oh, yes, it is. If you're not aware, in the UK, it's kind of super industry. Uh, one editor commented uh, within the article, there are so many books as a publisher where you miss the mark a little bit, either commercially or critically. And I've often wondered, why wouldn't a writer want to try it again? So that's interesting. Uh, even the comment, there are so many books as a publisher where you miss the mark. <laughs> A good admission there. And interestingly, in an age where cancel culture is in the news, and we might think that's a modern thing, the article notes that Charles Dickens heavily edited Oliver Twist after a Jewish woman wrote to complain about the anti-Semitic depiction of Fagin. In 1867, sensitive to to an argument that his friend Wilkie Collins presented Jews more favourably, Dickens altered the phrasing in Twist before a reprint of the novel, so another edition. 
And of course, in the film world, creative revision is more widely accepted. Directors' cuts, for example, um, or films that were originally controversially edited, uh, often re- acquire greater cachet than the original. So I think that's a really interesting article because it's like an official stamp of acceptance on rewriting and republishing. Ben, if Ben Ockrey did it, and he is, uh, you know, Booker Prize winning novelist, very. Yeah, super A-list. In my mind, he's super A-list. I've loved his, uh, just a little personal story. Back in 1999, I was very miserable in my consulting job. I was determined to make a change in the millennium. And I went to a reading, Ben Ockrey, uh, a reading and um, basically listen to him read poetry and some of the things he said that night helped me to leave my job and head off to Australia which I did in the year 2000 and you can I've got an episode on that in uh, on my books and travel podcast my Australia trip uh well it was more than a trip I was away 11 years <laughs> but I'll, I'll always I always have a very fond spot for Ben Ockrey and when he comes to Bath I go and listen to him and, and all of that kind of thing so anyway he doesn't know who I am but it's one of those situations where you you know you you really like someone. So I'm glad I read that piece of news and I will be buying his new version, that's for sure. And in my personal update, I'm still editing Ark of Blood. I've I've only got a few more chapters to go and I've also been making NFTs, which of course I talked about in the last episode. I've been recording lots of interviews, generally doing lots of work around things that don't necessarily make money right now, but I'm learning a lot and putting things together And eventually, of course, you will get the benefit because I will share my process. I'll share my lessons learned. I've been doing like many, many hours of learning around Web3 stuff. And when I eventually figure it all out, I will be sharing it with you. I'm sharing some stuff, but um, I'm really trying to understand the business models and how things might shape out. Uh, So eventually I'll share more. Another thing that I've been doing and I will eventually share more about is book binding. (laughs) So yes, physical books and binding by hand. I did my second session at the book binders this week and essentially I go to a sort of private um, guy and we just have a one-on-one where we're making a limited edition of a thousand fiendish angels and so I did a, a print on demand through Amazon actually just I made a tiny a tiny size using vellum and then printed it with just a KDP cover I didn't get a cover design because of course we got the proof copy and then I just ripped the cover off and then we're using the text uh, the print on demand text as the text block in the book and this the size that I'm doing is not available in print on demand so um, I, I, I figured this is a kind of hybrid way because what we want to think with doing these individual projects is we don't want to have to print the a new version of the book because if you go to a printer's, they normally want at least a print run of 50 or whatever. And this is, to me, this is a super limited edition. So uh, we stripped off the cover last time we started the binding process this time we had some fun aging paper which I think I did back in school and it was so fun we basically put tea leaves in um like a container and put the paper in and then we used oil paints or I did he he just showed me and I I've done it all myself basically but we used um oil paints and tea leaves and a press and we did all kinds of cool things to make it look like it'd been aged this was just a quote page that I'm adding in the the quote from Dante's Inferno. So you can see some pictures on Instagram and Facebook at JF Penn Author. And yeah, I share my uh, the, the, some of the, the pictures anyway. I've also been buying handmade end papers and I can see how this could turn into an expensive hobby. Uh, I, I, as many of us do, I love stationery. And it was always like, well, I'm mainly digital in my world. I, I can't buy stas- lovely stationery. But now I'm like, yes, I can buy lovely stationery and use it in my handbound books. <laughs> So yeah, I'm having super fun. I'm also using my Sugar Skull stamp, which if you've seen on my um, NFTs, it, I'm going to use this stamp on my limited editions. And that will be for NFT digital limited editions. And also my physical limited editions will also have this stamp. And uh, if you haven't seen it, you can go, it's on, um, uh, where is it? It's on opensea.io forward slash jfpen. And uh, I'm, I'm basically using that stamp separately. And I got that commissioned. Uh, I, I paid a designer to design that. It's like a, a logo 
for my special editions. Again, all these things, I'm just playing with the possibilities of what it means to move, to blur the boundary now between being a uh, an author who does print on demand to being an artist who does beautiful limited edition products, whether they are physical or digital. So this is, I see this as a, a direction for my next decade. The question is what that actually means. <laughs> I don't know, but I have booked onto a five-day bookbinding course in the summer, so that will help me learn more of the craft. But I, I have dabbled in this before, but now I'm, I'm, I'm taking this quite seriously, and I do want to have a bigger office. So at the moment, I'm, so I'm recording this inside my audio booth, which takes up about a third of my small office. So my office was basically a kid's bedroom before we bought this house. So with this audio booth and my desk and a bookshelf, essentially there's not much more room, but I would like to have an analog creative desk at some point uh, to keep all my kind of physical book binding stuff. And uh, as I've mentioned several times, one of my goals this year is more physical, more digital, or more digital, more physical. Essentially go deeper into the world of digital and go deeper into the world of physical. And that includes my physical health and walking, but also the book binding and making things with my hands. So yeah, I hope that gives you some thoughts. I I mean, we are independent authors. Don't let the established narrative of indie, and this is what's interesting. We've been doing this now. I mean, the Alliance of Independent Authors is 10 years old. I've been doing this. I've been doing this business model since 2008, really. There are now, people say there are rules in indie, but there aren't. We are independent authors. We can do whatever we want <laughs> with our intellectual property. That's important. It has to be your intellectual property, but you can do this stuff. So don't constrain yourself by the so-called rules of what other people are telling you. Sure, there are some established ways in which to make income, um, but that should not constrain our creativity. So yeah, I'm, I, I'm actually feeling more creative than I've done in a long time. So yeah, I'm loving this. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments this week. Travis said, I love the point Nikesh made that readers should always see the antagonist's moral code or feel that the villain in some way has a point. A cackling, I'm so evil villain feels boring and unrealistic. Most people, even evil ones, justify their actions in their own minds. And thanks to Rob, who said, listening to your podcast, waiting in line at Hogwarts at Universal in Florida and sent a picture from the line with his family. And that was just lovely to see. I'm kind of thrilled that you're listening in line at Hogwarts. I have never had a picture like that before. So that was quite cool. And Jennifer S. Wheeler said uh, on Twitter... Joanna, I'm just gobsmacked by your vision and enthusiasm for the future. You're dragging me along behind you <laughs> and making it all seem real. Uh, yes, so I realise I'm dragging many of you kicking and screaming toward the future. But don't worry, we are early. I was thinking about this the other day. I am often, I am usually about four years early. <laughs> So if you think I've been talking about this stuff for maybe a year now, you've got another few years. So don't worry, I'm going to keep sharing what's going on. You don't need to do anything about the future. The future is going to arrive whether we want to or not, right? But um, I will keep sharing the journey. You can tweet me at The Creative Pen. Send me pictures of where you're listening to the show. Email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com or leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So today's show is sponsored by Findaway Voices and I'll play a word from them in a minute. And just to say on a personal note, I go wide with my audio through Findaway Voices for all my audiobooks now. And if you want to do a Kickstarter, they are a great option too. You can use their marketplace to find a narrator, pay for the files and then use them in your Kickstarter. And then later on, press publish to send them to the various wide audio networks. You can also sell direct, you can use Chirp and all the other marketing benefits if you want to go wide with audio, find a way, ser find a way services, <laughs> find a way voices .com is the service I use and recommend. And I'll play their ad in a minute. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating the show is sponsored by my patrons and especially the limited edition in between episodes, the futurist stuff. As I said, I'm spending a lot of hours sort of 10, 20 plus hours per week right now doing a lot of courses, tutorials. I'm just learning things so that I can eventually tell you things that hopefully 
will help you. (laughs) And that is supported by my wonderful patrons. And thanks to all the new patrons this week. I can only assume that you guys want more of the futurist stuff. So I really appreciate it. Thanks to Sarah Reese, Annie Shio Wen Wang, and I hope I said that right, Annie, Michelle Campbell Scott, Rebecca Adams, Michelle Galliota, and Harry Brooks. Thanks to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. I really appreciate it. And you can support the show with just a few dollars or there are many currencies now that you can use. And uh, you'll get the extra monthly Q&A audio where I answer questions on writing craft, publishing, self-publishing, book marketing, author business, and also the new Web3 stuff as well. So you get to ask your questions and I answer them in our private Q&A every month. So you can support the show at patreon.com com p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash the creative pen right i'll play a word from find away voices and then we'll get into the interview he's listening she's listening they're all searching for their next listen is your audiobook out there if not what's holding you back after this it won't be audiobook creation tools Introducing Findaway Voices Marketplace, the audiobook creation platform built for a world booming with audiobooks. Voices Marketplace gives you a searchable and trusted space to connect with narrators, free production and business tools, and the power to bring your audiobooks to market quickly. We've heard everything you have asked and used that to build an audiobook creation platform for you. Plus, we give you access to the world's largest audiobook distribution network, reaching listeners through more than 40 retail and library partners. No exclusivity. You keep your rights. This is your audiobook creation platform. Ready to get started? Make it on Marketplace. Monica Lionel is the author of the Productive Novelist and Book Sales Supercharged series of nonfiction books, as well as a USA Today bestselling author of fantasy and paranormal romance under the pen name Solo Storm. Her latest book for authors is Get Your Book Selling on Kickstarter, co-written with Russell Noelty, which I supported as a Kickstarter project. So welcome back to the show, Monica. Hi, thank you so much for having me on again. Oh, no. And this is such an interesting topic. So last time you were on a few years ago, we talked about your history. So we're just going to get straight into it today. So let's start with the basics. I mean, crowdfunding and Kickstarter have been around for years, but I actually spoke to an author recently who hadn't heard of either. So what is crowdfunding and what is Kickstarter? So crowdfunding is basically just asking people to fund something before it's done, at least the way that Kickstarter does it. So for Kickstarter, it's probably the biggest crowdfunding platform in the world as a creator. And Kickstarter really only has creator projects on there. And I'll explain what that means in a minute. But basically, as a creator, what you're doing is you're um, essentially just putting up a pre-order for your cool idea, your cool project. um, And you're basically saying, you know, I'm going to do this. This is how much money I need for it. Back it now. Give me the money in advance. And then I will deliver the project afterward. So that's that's basically how Kickstarter works. That's how crowdfunding works. So I do want to contrast it, though, with one platform that we see people kind of thinking it's similar to, which is GoFundMe which GoFundMe is a great platform, nothing against that type of crowdfunding platform, but that that platform tends to, it's not creator focused necessarily. So you could do a creator project on there, but you also see like, I have medical bills to pay. I'm about to lose my house. So you see a lot of that. So sometimes authors feel like Kickstarter is kind of a begging for money type of platform when it's not, it's really about, it's it's really just setting up a pre-order for a project that you are, confident you're going to deliver on, of course. Um, We don't want projects that you can't deliver on, but um, setting up a pre-order and getting people to support you in advance. Fantastic. But of course, playing devil's advocate, we already have an ecosystem for selling books. We can already do pre-orders for eBooks and print books. We can't necessarily do them for audio books, but we have this. So why would an indie author or a creator bother with the hassle of Kickstarter, especially since the sales won't help Amazon rankings or bestseller lists or anything like that? Like, why do we bother? 
<laughs> yeah, no, it's a great question and one that we hear all the time. I think there are a couple of things. So one is that Kickstarter is really a direct sales platform. So you don't have to pay the 30% royalties. You do have to pay other fees. So Kickstarter has a 5% fee that they take. And then there's payment processing fees. And so maybe you're paying like seven, 8% in that. And there's other costs to doing Kickstarter, but it's essentially direct sales. So it's a platform that you can use for that. And then the other big reason that I think is super important is the revenue per reader or the revenue per customer. So if you sell a book on Amazon, Let's say you're charging $4.99, you make about $3.40 off of that, off of every sale of an ebook. Um, you would you bring that over the Kickstarter. The revenue per reader um, or per backer is what it's called uh, for a publishing project tends to be between $25 and $40. If you're designing it with ebooks, you know, if, if you're doing like ebooks and print books, and if you're designing it the way that uh, Russell does his campaigns, basically. So there's a big difference in revenue. So especially if you're starting out, and even if you're not, you can make a lot more money off of very few backers. And then you can take that money and you can do a retailer launch after that and have money for ads or money for whatever else. Okay, so there's loose one pack there. And that revenue per customer back at 20 to $40 is kind of amazing. And we've obviously seen different things, but that will depend on what you're offering. So I know that some people who don't necessarily haven't maybe supported a Kickstarter will be like, well, why would someone pre-order an ebook for $20 or $40? So when you talk about designing campaigns, just, just give us an idea. What are the types of levels? There are different levels, aren't there? I can't remember what the term is, but you, you don't just offer a pre-order of an ebook and that's it. Yes, this is true. Okay, so they're called reward tiers. And what it is, it's basically a bundle. So if you think about on a retailer, you might have a bundle of a trilogy and you're able to sell that at a higher price, right? So on Kickstarter, you do reward tiers and every reward tier is a bundle. And so you can do cool things with that bundle that you can't do on a retailer. So for example, you could bundle an ebook, a print book, and an audiobook together and have people buy all three at once and have it at a higher price. You can do the pre, you know, the pre-orders for the print books, uh, which you, you can do on retailers as well, but you can also bundle other stuff like merchandise. You can bundle things that you can't really sell anywhere but direct. So you could bundle an audio commentary. You can bundle bookmarks. You can bundle postcards, basically any type of merchandise. And then also what I would call digital exclusives. So like that's a type of merchandise. So like the audio commentary, like I was talking about extra content, exclusive content, bonus content. And you can bundle all of that together. Um, you can also do signed copies, which is pretty hard to do on retailers. Uh, you, you typically have to like mail them something through FBA. Um, <laughs> and so you can just do a lot more. And the reason that the, the money is more per reader, per customer, per backer, whatever you want to call it, is because bundles just in general, you're able to increase your revenue per sale. And so if you launch your book on Amazon, you're selling one thing, it's the book and it's in these, maybe it's in three formats. So maybe you are, you're selling three things where uh, on Kickstarter, every reward tier is a different offer. So mm -hmm. you can add up different, like you can serve more people as well and add up um, different audiences. So that's another difference with retailers versus uh, Kickstarter. So on a retailer, you really want everything to be very tightly targeted because you don't want to mess up your algorithms and also bots and all that good stuff. Uh, whereas on Kickstarter, you want you want to add up many different audiences. So you want to have stuff that targets a fan, like a very, a very like ardent fan. You want to have stuff that targets kind of your lukewarm readers who are like, Eh, like I could read this book by this person, you know, if I'm bored, maybe not. And then you want to target people who have never heard of you before. So you're adding up a lot more audiences. You're adding up people who like print, people who like audiobook, people who like ebook, uh, people who like fan stuff, and just adding all of that up to make a bigger Kickstarter funding. Yeah. And that's, that's the key, I think. And of course, I saw your 
um, project, get your book selling on Kickstarter. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I want that book. And then there was, like you said, bundles of upsell with obviously you have tons of nonfiction books for authors. So you had a, I think you had a bundle of those, didn't you? And then there was sort of some audio stuff and courses. And so what kind of happens is the person who's engaged with the Kickstarter project who just goes to that page then finds a whole load of options where they can really decide what level they want to support at. And they may still just pre-order the ebook for $10 or whatever, right? But they could also end up spending more. I mean, what about people offering things like consulting or one-on-ones and things like that, which is that access, the highest tier? Yeah, definitely. So that's another thing that you can't really sell on a retailer. So as a nonfiction author, if I'm selling a course, which we did sell a course, I can't sell that on a retailer. There's no way to upload a course on on Amazon. And and I can talk about it in my book and then get people to my website and then get people to my email list and then get people to my course. But I can't just sell them the course directly while I'm selling them the ebook. And so Kickstarter allows me to do that. So not a ton of people are going to take me up on that. But let's say 10% of the people who are interested in the book are also, they're also like, yeah, I have a couple hundred extra bucks and I want to get to know this person better. So I'll also upgrade to the course. And that really matters. That extra money, that matters. Whereas if I just sold them the book on a retailer like Amazon or or any retailer, I'm kind of using Amazon as the placeholder there. But if I just sold them the book, they may never take that long path to my website, to my email list to hear about my course, you know, they're not going to take that long path there. I'm going to lose more and more people at every step of that. So that's a huge thing for nonfiction authors. And we do see like for a nonfiction author, our campaign hit, it was one book and it hit, and and we had a lot of other offers as part of that, but it was ultimately one book and we hit 21,500. And then I haven't done all the numbers afterward, but in the fulfillment phase, we've got to over 24,000. So that's another thing about Kickstarter that you don't see is that people actually fund higher because of the fulfillment phase. So if Russell and I had launched Get Your Book Selling on Kickstarter just on retailers, we would never have made that much money. It's just, it's too niche of a book. So we were able to make that money off and that we had 537 backers. So we've probably ultimately had still less than 600 people interacting with our Kickstarter, but we were able to make close to 25,000. That is really great. And thank you for sharing those numbers because (laughs) I feel like the Kickstarters we hear about, for example, Brandon Sanderson's Way of Kings, which raised $6.7 million (laughs) a couple of years ago. (laughs) And that was for a limited print edition, leather bound, you know, hardback, sort of massive project. And obviously he worked with a printer and blah, blah, blah. But it made it seem like Kickstarter is is out of reach. Like none of us are Brandon Sanderson. None of us are going to raise, well, it's unlikely we're going to raise 6.7 million, to be (laughs) honest. But what you've said there. So I love that. So let's say 24,000 from uh, just under 600 people. And like you said, if you'd have just put that on the stores, then there's no way you would have made anywhere near that. So, it, but let's take it even lower. So if someone doesn't have an audience at all, because obviously you have books, you, you've got an audience, you did it with Russell, who's also got an audience. So if someone, what numbers should we go for? Because I mean, could we even put one up for like a thousand dollars and aim really low at the beginning and then build up? Yeah. So Kickstarter is an all or nothing platform. So if you don't hit your, so you have to set a funding goal. If you don't hit the funding goal, you don't get any money. And that's to protect you because lots of projects, like if you're doing an audiobook, for example, you actually need like $2,000 to do that audiobook. So you don't want to be on the hook to deliver it if you didn't hit the goal. And so what Russell recommends is that for every book that you're doing on Kickstarter, you have a $500 goal. So if he's doing a trilogy as like his main thing for the campaign, he would set the goal at $1,500. And so we have actually, this is not theory. We've actually tested this with a group of 70 authors. And so not all of them launch. We probably have had 20 launches But every single one of our authors has funded. We've seen funding on poetry. We've seen funding on 
children's books. We've seen funding on book boxes for romance authors, for cozy mystery authors. So we've actually tested this with people. Some people, it was their first book and Mm. they were able to fund at, so everybody in our group has funded at over a thousand dollars. And then a bunch of them have funded at over 2,500. And then some of the, some of the best ones have funded at over 4,000 as well. So if you had an audience, if you kind of followed Russell's system really carefully, those people funded at like four to 5,000. And we did have somebody fund at 20,000, but they're kind of a unicorn because they have, they had a big audience. Mm. Um, so we did, we did have that person as well. They're nonfiction as well. So they funded at over 20,000, but uh, the other authors, they were, they were just able to fund because they um, avoided a lot of the mistakes basically that people can make during the Kickstarter project. And some of them, it was their, first, it was their very first book. Like they haven't launched on any retailers yet. And they were able to fund, um, I, th- I think one funded at, it was over 3,500, I'm pretty sure. And then one funded at over 4,000. So I do think it's good for people who have an audience of zero. I, I do recommend at least reading the book that we have, Get Your Book Selling on Kickstarter, because that's going to help you uh, be able to do that. Because we also, we see a lot of projects that are don't do that. And, and we kind of can see why, because um, it is a specific it's a specific system and there's some business principles that are not required for retailers that are required for direct sales. And so mm. I think a lot of it is just learning direct sales, just principles in general. Yeah. And I think that's really important. It, Kickstarter is its own platform, its own ecosystem. And there are people who just hang around on Kickstarter, right? That's where they like to buy projects <laughs> yeah. because it means you you can support creators you love. I mean, I've supported lots of Kickstarters and other crowdfunding things. And I feel like I'm helping this creator. I'm getting something cool and that might not be available in another way. And you're part of the project more, right. almost, aren't you? But you mentioned there mistakes <laughs> yeah. I, I mean and the, the book is the book is seriously good value everyone as I said I I backed the kickstarters so I got the book and it's jam-packed with tips so we cannot possibly get to everything but just give us a couple of like common mistakes that that people make that may jeopardize their project yeah so one of the biggest things for publishing projects is like a lot of authors want to fund their audiobook well the challenge with funding your audiobook through Kickstarter is that Kickstarter is really focused mostly on print and also ebook as kind of part of the print piece, though. So you have to understand the publishing side of Kickstarter has been built through comics, children's books, photo books, basically anything that doesn't do well in print on demand or is not profitable in print on demand. Those authors have had to go to Kickstarter because they got to do larger print runs. It costs more money to make a book. And so that's the the people who have used Kickstarter and publishing are the people who were not able to use retailers um, for publishing. So they weren't able to do eBooks. They weren't able to do print on demand. And so the thing that sells best on Kickstarter right now is a print book, just kind of obvious reasons. So sometimes we see people doing an audiobook focused campaign, and it's not that those can't succeed. It's just that you're going to make um, probably like three to five X more if you do a print focused campaign, even if you end up using that money to fund the audiobook, Mm. even if you end up putting the audiobook as a stretch goal or as like part of your campaign, one of the reward tiers. So that's another thing is you can sell multiple things. So you should have a focus for your Kickstarter campaign. So it's not confusing, but you can sell other things on that page as well. So you can have it focused on print and then you can still sell the audiobook there. So we, so that one tweak, you know, typically, I mean, you're going to like two to five X your campaign just by making that tweak. So there's a lot of little things like that. Another one that people really mess up is profitability on their reward tier. So I'll give you a really easy example. So one thing that people do is they try to sell their paperback book for $15 with free shipping in the US. And and they're like, well, it only costs me like three, three to four dollars to print my book through print on demand. But people are not factoring in the other costs, like the Kickstarter fees, the payment processing fees, the cost of shipping through media mail or um, 
we'll, we'll talk about shipping actually as the third one, <laughs> um, the third common issue, they, but they're not factoring in all these other costs. You have to pack the books yourself. You have to get the books printed in like a larger shipment and ship to you. So you're going to pay shipping costs twice, once to ship to you, once to ship to other people, you have to pay for the packaging. So when you add all of that up right now, it costs, even with like good print on demand stuff, it costs about, you know, 10 to $15 to get that paperback to somebody. So what Russell does is he charges $25 for a paperback book and $40 for a hardcover. So when you hear those numbers, you may be like, wow, that's kind of a lot. Um, and how can I do that when the books, if the books on Amazon for like, $14.99 with free shipping. And the answer is you can't. <laughs> so that's a, that's another thing is you've got to, if you're doing Kickstarter, you got to look at places where you're competing with yourself. So Amazon is always going to be able to ship to print and ship a paperback book for cheaper than you can and faster than you can. So you can't have, the only thing you have there that is valuable is exclusivity. And so you, you saw, you see that with our project, we did our Kickstarter launch um, for the book and the print book is not available for at least six months after that, because we have to give that exclusivity and make sure that the people who backed, they got something special out of it, basically. Mm. So we see that where $25, $40, you kind of have to be able to be willing to raise your prices on retailers and then, okay. So the shipping thing, this is something we see is people assume that because they're books, they can ship via media mail in the U S I think UK also has media mail. Um, so different countries have, uh, and it's called something different, but it's basically a special shipping because it's a piece of media. So a book. So then people do stuff like they'll add a bunch of merchandise. And the minute you add even like a bookmark, um, mm -hmm. like a, a postcard, like a pin, then you're not in media mail territory anymore. You can't ship that way. And the costs are double at that point. So you have to be very careful about what you're adding as merchandise. And lots of people are like, I want to do like coffee mugs. Um, coffee mugs are a very, very low margin item. So you're mm. not, you're not going to make money off of it. It's expensive to ship. It's breakable. So <laughs> you may have to replace stuff. So you're probably going to lose money on that. So that's another thing we see is people just don't pick high margin stuff. Um, the highest margin stuff is going to be digital. And then from there, if it's a physical product, you kind of need to look at what's going to be higher margin. So like books are high margin, um, enamel pins are high margin. You do, you probably have to ship them separately, but they are high margin. Uh, typically you can buy them for a dollar and you can sell them at like events and cons and that sort of thing for like 10 to $15. Uh, so you, you have to look at what merchandise is going to be high margin, what merchandise is going to be very low margin. So like t-shirts, coffee mugs, like mm. that sort of stuff is going to be low margin. And so you don't really, even though it's cool, you can have in your Kickstarter project, because you like it and because it's cool, but it's not going to make you money. Yeah, well, there's some great tips there. Just one thing on the merchandise I want to point out to everyone, point of information, you might not have the intellectual property rights for your book cover to put on merchandise. So don't assume people listening that just because you paid a book cover designer, you have those rights because there are different rights for different images for diff for things like books versus merchandise. So I think that that's important as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. You have to have an extended license to put it on merchandising. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can ask. It's not like it's it's forbidden, but you have to ask and you have to get that license. It might be free. You might have to pay some more. But yeah, certainly that's that's important. So that's really great on, on the issues. And in fact, this profitability is... Uh, one thing people are very scared of. I'm scared of it myself. Um, <laughs> but I think what you've done there is really good because you've essentially said bundle other things. So for example, the signed print edition would be exclusive, but I could also bundle it with a digital audio and the ebook and a course or something. And that will that will make it it better. But I do want to tackle some other fears. So and this is entirely <laughs> this is entirely me, but it might also be people listening. So I love 
the way we publish because I write my books and then literally when I send it to my editor, so the book is finished, uh, so I know I can hit a pre-order. So I never do long pre-orders. I do pre-orders once the book is essentially done. I am really scared of the thought of having hundreds or thousands, hopefully, of people waiting for my book to arrive because I don't have to feel that way right now. And so how do you tackle that fear of having all these people hanging over you waiting for this deadline? So what Russell does, and I didn't do this on my because it was my first campaign, and I should have. So I'll just tell you what he does because he's the person to watch. Um, <laughs> so what Russell does is he actually does he makes sure the book is completely done, the book or the books completely done, edited, ready to ship, at least in digital. So he does that, and that seems to work really well for him. He can fulfill a campaign in less than a month at this point because he just has really good systems around it. So the key point number one is get your thing done before you launch your Kickstarter. And then the second thing I would say is think about fulfillment during at the latest during your Kickstarter. So one thing that I did not do that I should have done is set up backer kit or there's other fulfillment services, but basically Kickstarter's fulfillment services aren't great. So, you know, instead you can, and and what it is, is after, after your campaign ends, you've got to send out a survey to collect information from your backers. So if you do this through a, a fulfillment service like backer kit, you can set it all up ahead of time and you can send out your survey faster. There is an approval process of like three or four days. So that was something I didn't know. <laughs> so I'm, I'm letting you know that it's important. And you can kind of set all of that up in advance and do it during your campaign so that you're able to just move through that fulfillment process faster. If you want to get your books printed, you can start to get your books printed ahead of time, but most people, they need the money from the campaign. So the the campaign will end. You have seven days um, to, uh, to, Kickstarter takes seven days to charge everybody to get like stragglers, like decline credit cards and all that. And then they pay out another seven days. So you're not going to get the payment for that for 14 days. So really just factoring in that type of stuff into your timeline can help too for on, on the print side. Um, the digital stuff, it's like, yeah, you can probably distribute it kind of quickly, I would say. But the print stuff, it's at least 14 days. Once you have that, then you can turn around and you can go to, um, there's a couple good printers. So one is Mixam, it's M-I-X-A-M. Uh, you can use Lightning Source, of course, or Barnes & Noble or KDP. And then another one, I think it's called like 48 Hours. And, and so like knowing your... Um, the people that you're going to work with or the companies that you're going to work with ahead of time can help too. getting the price quotes ahead of time, which you should do anyway, basically, like before you even set up your campaign. But having those quotes, having even you can actually also start to upload the files to those um, places ahead of time so that especially if it's your first one, so that you know, like what their system does and like the weird way that they need their files uploaded, that sort of thing. And so Mm -hmm. you can start to do a lot of the fulfillment ahead of time and you can see, so Russell is able to really predict his campaigns um, from doing it so long. And we put those numbers in the book. Um, I don't remember them off the top of my head, but basically you you can predict, oh, I'm going to need like 300 copies of this book because I have this many backers at this level. So you can start to predict that toward the end of your campaign as well and get it set up ahead of time. Yeah, I think this is what scares me and puts me off. And (laughs) and I think, you know, if I'm feeling that other people will do, which is, there's a there's a whole lot to organize and one of the beauties of course of self-publishing print on demand and, and ebooks and stuff is it's you upload it and you make a mistake so you're like you just upload another file and it's done and and this print run thing is it just scares me <laughs> but equally I really want to do this like I am uh I'm really thinking of doing my next craft book which will be how to write a novel <laughs> I, I have to do it you know I, I have to do it I want to do it and I think that it might be quite a good project but what I'm wondering because you mentioned so many things there are there people like project managers you can just hire to run 
campaigns. And of course, that cost would have to go into it too. But it feels like there's a whole lot to learn. It's like starting again on a whole nother platform. Yeah, it absolutely is. It's definitely starting again on a whole nother platform. If you're familiar with direct sales, which a lot of nonfiction authors are pretty good at direct sales, there's going to be less of a learning curve than if you are not familiar with direct sales. Uh, because there's a lot of similarities. So there are definitely companies that can do Kickstarter for you. I don't know of any that specialize in publishing, but I do think that there are some people, um, especially as, because because Russell and I, we have a community that we're building around Kickstarter. And so that could be a place to go to. So finding somebody who has done a Kickstarter before, who maybe is willing to, do some admin hours on your Kickstarter, that could be something good as well. Um, So that it's somebody who knows how to do a publishing Kickstarter, who knows how to do a fiction Kickstarter, because the other thing about Kickstarter is that they have games on there. They have all sorts of other categories and trying to apply the stuff that works in those categories to a fiction book. It doesn't always work as well. Kind of the same, you know, selling a board game direct It's not going to be the same as selling a book direct. So you kind of have to be a little cautious if you're using a company um, just because there's no company that that I know of anyway that is specializing in the publishing space. So so that would be what I would look out for. But I think there's definitely um, ways to get help. Look for people who have done a Kickstarter before. Look for people who have done a Kickstarter with Russell before uh, or under Russell's mentorship because I think that um, they'll be able to do a lot of that admin. Mm. Oh, well, I'll just put that out into the world then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got you. I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. I'll let you know some people. <laughs> I, I, I do think because, you know, we all have so much going on anyway. And yeah, I really feel like this would be a good project. So yeah, that's out in the world and we'll see where that goes. Um, <laughs> but let's um, let's talk about marketing because I feel, I mean, you mentioned authors who are in your community who didn't even have an audience, but if an author sets up a Kickstarter, what are the best ways to market that? Yeah. So I think as publishing, as more fiction authors get on the platform, I think there will be kind of a network of support. So doing those essentially like a cross cross promotion, uh, that could be a good thing. So Uh, Some of the other things that I think work really well. So one thing you can do is you can get a pre-launch page. So it's just like a landing page that kind of gives a little bit of info about your project and people can follow you. And so I think, especially if you are um, typically just on retailers and you're trying to get your audience to move over. So this isn't for the audience of zero question, but if you're trying to get your audience to move over, Uh, I think that that's a really great way to do so is to send them to the pre-launch page and ask them to follow you because it requires them to set up a Kickstarter account. It requires them to show like some sort of visible interest. And when your campaign launches, everybody who follows the project is going to get an email immediately. So it's kind of like a pre-order. It's like a pre-order segment of your email list, basically, when people follow you. And they'll they'll get pre they'll get emails throughout the campaign. So I think there's definitely one at the beginning. There may be a couple at the beginning. There's definitely some at the end as well. And I'm not sure about the middle. But one thing that I've seen is that the follower count corresponds to the total funding. So so we kind of see that. And it's a way to talk about your campaign ahead of time and then also to test and test marketing messages, but then also to test to see how much interest there is. So that's a huge one. The author swaps or like the cross promotion um, is a huge one. And we we saw some of that, you know, with it being a community, we saw some people cross promoting and that probably helped. Russell also says that if you can bring 25 people to your campaign, then Kickstarter will bring another 25. So that's important. Campaign design is important. So I know it's like a marketing question, but really the marketing starts with the campaign design, same as the marketing starts with the product. So campaign design is very important and getting those reward tiers right kind of from the beginning is really helpful. And you'll be able to tell pretty immediately, like when those, those reward tiers are not right, um, you can tell because the campaign's not funding very quickly. And so being willing to uh, change directions as well. So 
you know, one thing is when Russell has to raise a lot of money, he makes the time frame longer on purpose because then if he's like watching the projections and seeing those numbers not on target, then he can get rid of those reward tiers. So you can limit a reward tier that's not doing well and then create a new one. So you can do all sorts of stuff during the Kickstarter to kind of readjust to get back on target. But other than that, I think, I think really any, anything else, any other way to market a Kickstarter campaign or or to market anything, to market a book can work on Kickstarter. The one thing that does not work well is Facebook ads directly to the Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because if you're going to do Facebook ads on your Kickstarter, the best practice is to have a $50 per backer um, average or better. And so publishing projects, um, they typically fall for, for books, especially they typically fall between 25 and $40. So you're just kind of the publishing projects in general are just below the threshold with a nonfiction, you know, you can maybe get away with it. Uh, but what Russell has done is he does, he does Facebook to email list, and then he does email list to Kickstarter. Yeah, so as usual, email list is is a good thing. Um, but it, what's interesting also is you mentioned there the pre-launch page and the people that I followed on Kickstarter, which now include you, obviously, I'm basically now notified. If you do another Kickstarter, I'm now notified, right? So it's yeah. almost, is it if you're going to do a Kickstarter, is it more about planning the longer term ecosystem? Because I know obviously Russell does lots now because then otherwise you're kind of wasting that that future potential. So should you have a longer time frame in mind for sort of other projects? Yeah. So Russell does, he does four to six Kickstarters a year. I wouldn't start out that way so, <laughs> but because um, that's a lot. So yeah, I think planning on using Kickstarter maybe um, once a year or twice a year could be valuable. And maybe it's only for like the, the big projects or like one of the best projects that we've seen on Kickstarter is a a never before been published trilogy. So maybe you typically write longer series, but then you just have this trilogy idea that you want to try on Kickstarter. Maybe you do like one of those a year. That could be a good way to use it because you're right. Uh, So if somebody follows the project, they get notified during the project. If somebody follows you as a creator, they get notified every time you do a project. So that's that's uh, very key. And so one of the reasons Russell's projects like do so well now is because a lot of people are following him. Mm. Uh, And the other thing, and so there's that. And then there's a third one, the third tool um, similar to those first two that Kickstarter sends stuff on your behalf, basically. And then there are some other things like Projects We Love is a popular one. You know, basically you want to contact Kickstarter and tell them about your project. And then they're like, oh, great, that's a project we love. And so when they give you that stamp of approval, then people on Kickstarter in the Kickstarter ecosystem, they start to look at your project and the project appears higher in search results. And there's all sorts of little things that go with that. They also have Kickstarter project of the day, which our campaign was, um, I think it was, you know, in week five or some, somewhere around there. And it did have a big boost. Our campaign also benefited from, I think Craig, Craig Martell posted about it in the 20 books Vegas group, which was really helpful to us. We had a pod, you know, a podcast interview with Joe Solari that was really helpful. And so that was another, another thing I forgot in the marketing because there, there's lots of things. So one thing that Russell does is he does some sort of live event slash streaming in the first week and something in the last week. And then he tries to do, you know, maybe he tries to have like a podcast interview scheduled for each week throughout the campaign or some sort of other PR. Like it could be a podcast, it could be a guest post, but some sort of visibility for each week throughout the campaign. And that really helps too. Um, Because it's a fan-based platform, uh, you know, being visible to people either in person, on video, or on audio is huge because people get to know you and then they want to support you in a bigger amount. So those types of things can be really helpful. Brilliant. Well, the book is jam packed and uh, the book is Get Your Book Selling on Kickstarter. So where can people find the book as well as everything else you do online? So people can find the book at kickstartyournovel.com. 
That's our headquarters for the book. And then for me, you can find me at theworldneaturebook.com and you can find Russell, my co-author at um, russellnolte.com. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Monica. That was great. Yeah, thank you for having me. So I hope you found the interview with Monica interesting. And as I mentioned, I'm intending to do my own Kickstarter in the next few months around how to write a novel. So I'll share updates on that. And of course, as ever, I'll share lessons learned along the way. Definitely check out Monica and Russell's book. And even if you want to kickstart nonfiction as the lessons apply to that too. So next Monday, I'll be talking about intuitive editing, a creative and practical guide to revising your writing with Tiffany Yates Martin. So back to a craft effort episode. Right. Happy writing. And I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time. <laughs>